So um, I know that you did a little bit of research with um, uh, brain stimulation in norm in normal states, right? So not necessarily in injured states. Yeah. And then you assessed sort of people's visual processing normally, like normal people, no brain injury, no nothing, and then assess if you could enhance their sort of visual processing state. Mm -hmm. Can you can you just start off with that? Yeah, and in, in fact, that's the thing I can talk the most about. Let's uh, talk. Indeed. So we are very interested in sustained attention. So everything you do in your daily living you need to be attentive right and you notice that your attention goes up and down up and down oh yeah you're very concentrated and focused and then a minute later like wait a minute what am i thinking what what am i doing right it happens all the time yeah. to everybody yeah uh, different phases during the day when you're tired is horrible when you're fresh you just got up and you're happy and you can focus right. so but sustain attention is a function that you have to sustain your attention for a few seconds few minutes half an hour and uh, so what we do uh, we deliver simulation over the uh, trns over the parietal lobes bilaterally mm -hmm. so in the two homologous areas mm -hmm. uh, the superior parietal lobe and uh, we make this function improve in this in subjects, healthy subjects, healthy keeping, young subjects. Keeping so attention. Yes. Over so the parietal lobe. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So people improve like up to twenty percent, thirty percent, which in in uh, behavioral measurements is a big jump. Okay. okay? Is a lot. Right. And as I said before, we see these changes in functional connectivity. Okay. This is great. Okay. But we also did something else. Uh, I was uh, talking a few minutes ago about priming the cortex. Uh, mm -hmm. So putting the cortex in the best state possible to improve, right. to do better. Right. To learn. Okay? To learn. To learn. Exactly. Right. And so um, another postdoc in my lab, she's now at, the N at NIH in Bethesda, she actually did very something very interesting. She primed people's uh, parietal lobes uh, before uh, they did uh, the sustained attention task. And by priming, you mean With you TRNS. deliver, you deliver yes. TRNS yes. stimulation yes. to yes. the parietal you have lobes, them sit right? There, you deliver TRNS to the right. parietal lobe. And then you do further manipulation and then you measure their behavior. So if you do that kind of sustained attention task that we use in the lab, okay. you are good for 45 minutes. And then after that, your performance drops dramatically. That is in the context of no stimulation. You just have someone do yes. a sustained task. I ask you to do this sustained right. attention task. Right. Multiple objects are moving in your visual field. Okay. And you're uh, just trying to concentrate on a, on a subset of moving items. Okay. Okay. So it's quite difficult to do because right. things are moving fast. Right. So if you do this task, you can sit there and doing ideally and optimally for about 45 minutes. Okay. But if I prime your brain with TRNS and then I have you do the task again afterwards, you're good up to 90 minutes. Okay. So I double the capacity of okay. your uh, sustained attention. So that's a lot. That is a lot. Right? So that was in the context of, again, just regular people come in. Young you prime students. that. students. Usually the standard is you can only do this for 45 minutes. You do transcranial random noise stimulation over both parietal lobes. Yes. Right. And then you have them do that again. Right. And they Correct. can actually do it for 90 minutes. Yes. So doubled it. So that's pretty good. That's pretty incredible. It's pretty good. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. So um, pretty exciting. And so, yes, I think young people can improve their function. And then what about uh, the sustainability of that? Did you check them again in like three months, six months? Uh, or no? Not yet, but uh, we will do that in another experiment that we're now running. So uh, we will check how long does it last. So right. because when you do all this manipulation, the ideal scenario is to have this long term potentiation effect, right. which means that not only is there now, but you can also continue later on right. uh, in subjects uh, life. Right. We have been able to do this with TRNS before because in a different study, what we did was um, stimulating again the occipital cortex in subjects that were doing some motion discrimination tasks. That did not have brain injury? They did not brain injury, just yeah. young, healthy, um, students. Right, students. As healthy Harvard, as Harvard students? Be. No, actually Italian students. Oh, Italian this students. This was in Italy. Okay. And it worked really well. Okay. <laughs> 
So I expect the Harvard students outperform them. Even better? Maybe. Really? Well, Maybe that's it. why they outperform. Know. Maybe that's why they're so good is because you're delivering transcranial ra- right. random noise <laughs> stimulation too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so this is interesting because we see this beautiful improvement in these visual abilities that we were testing. Right. But then we told the, pa- uh, the subject, sorry, the healthy students, uh, please come back in six months. Okay. So they did. Came back in six months. Their abilities were still there. So it's nothing decayed. So they were still very good compared to people who simply trained on the same task. Mm-hmm. It got a little better, but you know, later on they were still there, but just a little better. Right. Or other control simulation conditions. So as I was saying at the beginning, you need to have a sham control. You, need to, uh, you might have an active control simulation condition. So we add all those parts. Uh, right. But what we notice is that those who improved the most were those people who had TRNS over the visual cortex. Okay. And six months later, that effect was still there. Okay. So that would be the ideal scenario in healthy and in patients too, obviously. Got it. Got so it. Have you noticed that sustained effect in the brain injured patients or just in the... We uh, haven't tested that yet. Tested so it? this is the, the clinical trial we just started. I was mentioning at the beginning okay. uh, with uh, um, a cortically blind patients. Right. Uh, in those patients, we're going to ask them to come back three months later. Right. So I mean, this is this is pretty incredible, right? Like, if this could is. if this could um, um, either supplement or completely replace pharmaceutical medications in ADHD, <sighs> wouldn't yeah. that be awesome? Yeah. I mean, I know li- there's this whole thing about people suffering su- f- uh, adverse side effects from ADHD medications, right? Very true. You know, either it, it puts them too high, the crash is too bad, and you know. Yeah, not it only that, difficult. W- we have a little study that we did in collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Sarah Mednick at UC Irvine. Mm-hmm. She's a sleep expert, okay. uh, beautiful work on sleep studies. And so she was comparing the sustained attention task I was mentioning before, our task, we did that together. She compared that wi- in uh, students who were either taking uh, the uh, Ritalin or they just did uh, the training and uh, with the, with a the, they just did a uh, sorry the sustained attention task and those subjects who d- took the retailing had kind of like an immediate uh, burst but then the next day they they did not perform well so right so just to, just to summarize ki- people took Ritalin they did the sustained attention task they did really well on the sustained attention task that day but decay quickly right and then but then the next day you had them do the sustained attention task again did they take the Ritalin again that day no no, no they no, just no, take no. it just again just one nice leap right. in between and then yeah. they did they did worse well, yeah exactly and how was that worsened uh, performance on sustained attention task relative to um, like I your control group was it way worse I think there was no difference I don't think it was way worse but okay. it's kind of saying that you might have uh, a temporary burst of something when you take it but that that does not translate into a benefit uh, into a long term benefit at right, all right, so right. on top of that you might have side effects like like bad night sleep right. uh, and so all sorts of side effects that are yeah. not good for you yeah. so but um it seems like we are here giving an impression that you can use CMS to become amazing. So I want to make sure that it is clear that everything has to be properly designed as a protocol right. and uh, what works for somebody might not work for others. And so, you know, I yeah. just don't want to give the impression that you would just stimulate the brain and, and everything gets better. Everything gets better. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, like um, it was the same. I had an episode with the uh, psychedelic episode recently mm-hmm. on how psychedelics can help with mental health and a bunch of stuff. Um, and it was the same thing. Right. Where it's like you can't just like take mushrooms and then, you know, your life gets better necessarily. Right. That won't happen for everyone. Right. But that it, is actually another interesting area. Right. The micro dosing thing right. where you can you don't necessarily have to take the dose that gives you just hallucinations right. and things like that but you can just be micro dosing and you know there are these interesting effects upon mood disorders right. Right. and so forth so right. i kind of find it very interesting you find it well you should check out the episode if yeah. you haven't yet but um but what i like so but what i like about neuro uh neuromodulation neurostimulation is the fact that you can take that neuroplastic effect that maybe is experienced in microdosing or any other systemic uh medication or administration of whatever sort of drug and you can focus it which is really really cool so tell me what you found about um 
performance, like athletic performance or anything like that with neuromodulation? Or yeah, so there seems to be some indication that it might help athletic performance. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, with all the all sorts of ethical issues that you might have with that, as you were mentioning before, right? Should we allow this to happen or not? Uh, because this is a procedure not available to everybody. Right. So what happens to those athletes that can use it and those who cannot and so on and so forth? So they might end up not uh, uh, just uh, taking it out of the process, but uh, there seem to be some indication that it might help. Uh, um, especially, um, my impression is that it might help just feeling less fatigue. So it's kind of like an effect mostly on the mood. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so people might work harder just because they feel better, right. but uh, not because their muscles are necessarily performing better. Yeah. So, which, you know, this brings the placebo effect to into into question mm. and uh, which is actually a great effect right. right many studies they don't see any differences between active whatever m manipulation you're doing and placebo right but then okay so placebo might be a very interesting effect to study right. too on top of it so are you saying that because the studies that have come out don't necessarily have sham groups or like have sham controls yeah so exactly. you're saying that because they're exactly. just using yeah. it and seeing benefits and many of them don't right. so uh so that leaves me a little doubtful about their results but uh, at the same time, it might be interesting. For instance, uh, a classical manipulation that you might do is uh, interfere with activity of M1, which is uh, your uh, motor cortex. Right. And uh, you might think of uh, uh, supporting, uh, uh, um, you know, as an adjuvant uh, procedure to do the brain stimulation while you're doing some performance with your arms, for instance. Okay. okay? And so that might put your cortex in a good state of responding properly uh, with your training. Um, so I think I've seen studies that seem pretty uh, interesting and uh, reliable and uh, where, you know, subjects seem to feel stronger. But again, it might just be the feeling of feeling stronger. Right, than because you've done it, because there's no there's no placebo control. But um, what about I remember you telling me about um, they actually measured um, an SSEP after neurostimulation. Do you remember telling I me about that? I remember telling you about that. No, it's <laughs> so basically like an SSCP, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's sort of a measure of um, the conduction from your brain to the actual muscle itself. Yes, exactly. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so we were talking about motor evoke potentials yeah. in that case. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was, yeah not SSCP, so, so yeah, yeah, exactly. So what you can do, uh, uh, you can actually uh, find the right location of where your muscles on your hands will respond to stimulation. Right. So we're talking about phosphines before. The phosphine was like you stimulate the occipital cortex and you see the visual phosphine. Mm -hmm. In the case of motor cortex, you deliver the pulse uh, over the motor cortex and you see a response like a twitch in, right. in the end. And in that, in some of the studies, you can see actually uh, changes in the amplitude of the motor evoke response. Uh, okay. okay, so you can measure that with electrodes, right. and you can see that response will be stronger. Does that mean that you might be better at your sport performance? It might mean that. Uh, um, I'm not so sure about that, but yeah. it it is an interesting effect. Yeah. yeah so definitely. you stimulate, and then you you're seeing an increased amplitude. Rather than if you were just moving it normally without the stimulation. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you stimulate on one side and response will be on the contralateral limb and so forth. Right. Yeah. yeah. And what about, um, so we talk about, you talked about priming uh, recently in terms of like um, visual, like basically being able to sustain your, your attention and different things like that. Um, and I think that's a big basis for it not not necessarily using this when you're performing, right? But rather using it when you're trying to learn a new task, right? Relating to um, uh, ath athletic performance, right? So for basketball, you know, if you're going to go and you're going to start, you know, shooting and trying to figure out, you know, what's what's the appropriate way to shoot, trying to get a feel for your shot, I guess maybe you would you would you would uh you would think more soccer. Right, because you're, Ita <laughs> you're Italian. Italian. So I don't know. Uh, you know, if you're heading or or, or you're practicing your um your shots or your penalty shots, right? Would priming your brain prior to doing those activities help you to consolidate and improve those uh, techniques faster and better? 
So it might help. So in fact, the majority of studies for sports performance is uh, precisely done that way. Like uh, you do some priming beforehand, which is you know just doing the stimulation before you do the actual task. Mm -hmm. Although based on our results, uh, my guess is that you might be able to get something better if you're being stimulating as you are doing something. Okay. Okay. So, because it's coupling the two that might work right. uh, better. Um, I don't know the details of it. How do you stay with the thing on your head? Right, right. But, uh, you know, it's not that difficult to, to position the electrode properly on the head and yeah. then uh, doing some tasks that you're doing. And um, I do wonder because you mentioned, you know, you do have sort of this increased neuroplasticity, not necessarily afterwards, but you have it 30 minutes afterwards. Right. So maybe doing the stimulation 30 minutes and then you do whatever it is that you, know, you want to do. Yeah, so you might find only. the later pick. Yeah, right, right. It, it might happen too. And in fact, there are some of these uh, motor evo potential studies where they actually find these um, heightened responses later on. So Got once it. you're done with the simulation, you can still see that. So okay. uh, that might respond to your hypothesis, right. which is, yeah, it might work right. in, in that case with a long-term effect. Right. And then in muscle endurance, I saw a study looking at, I think it was TDCS or some form of brain stimulation in cyclists, right? So in cyclists, and it showed um, um, the fact that their muscle endurance was much more improved. I don't remember if it had placebo and, and, and <laughs> sham control, but you're going to go home I, and think I, about I, the pl I, no, the I'm going to go home condition. and look at it and then say, OK, this is this might not have been the best study. But, you know, nonetheless, you know, again, conjecture, thinking theoretically how that would work. Certainly, you know, could it improve, um, you know, could it have sort of plastic changes in the neuromuscular junction? Right. Where you're having increased acetylcholine receptors or something going on uh, again strictly conjecture but um you know i'm sure i'm sure it, it it might be possible to think about that theoretically given the fact that you know we see if we stimulate here you know there's changes at other different parts of the brain right if we stimulate in the m1 cortex right it will there be uh, uh changes in the neuromuscular junction you know yeah so this brings me to the following point so um you can't really measure a marker that will tell you the difference between an athlete that has been through brain stimulation and one that is not been through that. So, you like cannot, reason, you cannot measure I that. I don't think so. So, okay. with doping, you can, you know, you do you do urine testing, right? And right. you can see whether they right. took you something. Do, you can do blood testing too. Exactly. Yeah. So, how do you determine uh, what is the level of something that you have done of your manipulation in order to say this should be allowed or should not be allowed. Right. Like how could you do. So let's say someone did do brain stimulation to enhance their performance. And then you're like, OK, let's measure your motor evoked potential. And it's increased. It's like, well, you must have done. It's like, no, maybe he's you know, maybe he's just that great where his motor evoked potential is yeah, greater than the standard. Exactly. Right? So how do you say, well, no, we have to. Uh, you're not qualified anymore because you did that manipulation. Right. So that sort of brings us to the point of neurodoping. Have you have you heard about this? Right. So neurodoping for people that don't know, and I mentioned earlier, but I'm going to talk about it again, is sort of now given some of this research research that's coming out and the fact that there are elite athletes using this sort of brain stimulation to enhance their performance, decrease their muscle endurance, potentially increase their, you know, uh, ability to recruit muscles and muscle and muscle strength. Due to that, now the World Federation is now thinking about, OK, are we going to ban this stuff or are we not? And this whole concept is the ethical concept is called neurodoping. Um, and you bring up a great point, which it's like. Listen, whether you want to ban it or not, it doesn't really matter because you can't measure whether someone's neurodoped or not yeah. unless you catch them in the act, you know? Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I don't really know how you can do that right. uh, precisely. So, um, What's your opinion on it? Do you think it should be banned or it shouldn't be banned? Well, uh, again, if I have to think in a, what is available to everybody and what should be available to everybody, if everybody has access to that, it might be okay. Right. Uh, well, but everyone has access to steroids. That's true. Right? <laughs> like, Still, But yeah. for some reason, there's like an ethical issue there where it's banned. 
Uh, I don't think it should be banned yet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this is my personal opinion and not being an expert on it. Right. So, but um, again, I don't even think if it's not properly used, I'm not sure it would be very helpful anyway. Right. So it really needs to be a process that you think about what you're doing. Right. And are, so, are you saying yet because uh, you don't, you just don't feel that the research is there yet? definitely denoting yeah, whether not, there's yeah, improvement Yeah, exactly. Or not. I don't think there are enough data to be able to uh, decide because many studies don't have sham controls. Right, so, right. Uh, but uh, again, I'm not necessarily against it right now. I don't have a strong opinion on it right. in a way. Right. So, but um, if, my, uh, if it helps, uh, you know, you might give it a try. <laughs> so that, you know, I think I think that kind of brings me to to my the next topic, which is adverse effects, right? So, you know, I think the the moral foundation for ba for banning steroids is, um, you know, oh, you know, it has adverse side effects, right? It decreases bone mineral density. It can have, you know, it has emo you you, ha you can have emotional ability, right? You can become angry more, you know, quicker. Yeah. Um, what are some adverse effects of neurostimulation and brain yeah, uh, brain so, electrical stimulation yeah so uh so well uh the most uh side effects are present if you do tms actually as opposed to the recurrent stimulation so tms might have side effects like uh, uh raising your your risk of having a seizure and things like that but with the recurrent stimulation actually and now it's been around for quite a while we don't really um uh, we haven't really seen uh, bad side effects, uh, even uh, when it, it's been used repetitively. So, um, you know, the main side effects are, you know, feeling tingly sen tingling sensation on, on the surface mm -hmm. where the electrode is positioned or, t or a, a itching sensation and so forth. And might, you, well, actually people doing by themselves at home in those uh, strange uh, do-it-yourself uh, procedure, yeah. they might get some burns. And so you might find these horrid pictures online of people, I burnt myself right, with the TBCS right, and right. so forth. But, you know, that doesn't happen in the lab or in a control uh, situation. I've never seen that happen and I've been doing this for quite a while. So honestly, as far as I can tell right now, I'm not aware of severe side effects mm. to the recurrent stimulation yeah. to your brain. Yeah. So. And so that makes me think that might be really very well tolerated and safe and yeah. so sh can be used. And even in the context of TMS, like when you say it decreases the seizure threshold, like that usually tends to be in patients that potentially already have seizures, exactly. right? It's and like, it's not really significant. It's not an adverse side effect that you typically run into from my understanding with TMS. Yes, you understand correctly. And in fact, I have a bigger experience, long longer with, experience yeah, with, with TMS, TMS than TDCS. I have never seen anybody having a seizure with right. our manipulations right. uh, that we do in the lab. Right. And uh, so I feel perfectly confident in using that too. Yeah. Uh, the issue with TMS is different. It's just that like, it's a bulkier machine. You can't just really purchase a TMS right. and uh, do the stimulation and right. so forth. So definitely the way the equipment works now is not feasible, it's not doable. Right. But uh, TMS does wonders for treatment for uh, major depression, for right. instance. Right. So we see at the clinic people coming, you know, clearly depressed and then leaving, uh, looking better in mm. overall. Yeah. So. Um, you know, and I think it's doing great things. It's FDA d approved and everything. Right. So, but for instance, when you run a study, one of the exclusion criteria that we use is exactly if you have a personal seizures. or family history of seizure, then Not you it. can't run the, the study. Yeah. But, you know, as I said, provided that you use all the precautions necessary and you're careful, I think it's both techniques are perfectly fine yeah i think you know i think it's absolutely amazing this sort of neuromodulatory space because it it seems like it's a legitimate a legitimate um uh alternative to medications in terms of changing altering uh neurological disease states or even psychiatric disease states it's like absolutely incredible and then you know you you pair that with the fact that um you know the adverse side effects are pretty minimal Exactly. Right. Exactly. As TMS, maybe, maybe not. 
probably not you know it's like it's absolutely incredible this new sort of um this new frontier of medicine in terms of like you you can modulate the brain you can change the circuitry in the brain like every time i think about that i just think about how amazing that is in terms of like head, heading in that direction listen to that elon musk <laughs> elon musk okay so let's <laughs> talk about i told you i was going to ask you about elon musk so i hope you've prepared your uh, your your answer for that um what do you think about neuralink so for people that don't know about neuralink Right. So Neur Neuralink is uh, sort of this company that Elon Musk has developed that is is seeking to um, invasively. You do a lot of non-invasive stuff. Right. So just over the head, over the, oh, uh, you know, yeah. above the scalp, uh, Elon Musk company. And I'd hate to speak, uh, you know, speak for them. Right. In terms of exactly what they're trying to do. But it sounds like from what I understand, they're trying to do is um, do some sort of invasive neuromodulation. Right. So potentially apparently it's going to start with people with brain injury right they're going to invasively implant electrodes on parts uh, injured parts of the brain and then hopefully improve their improve their recovery from injury right and then that's going to progress to the natural logical progression of things like this which is um then they'll do it in people that just want to enhance their cognitive performance or athletic performance you know to see are they able to do that and then um you know a lot of people have this sort of understanding that this is going to be the vector by which humans um sort of come together with uh intelligence and uh, artificial intelligence and technology and that's going to be the sort of new forefront of society um so what do you think about that <laughs> <laughs> um i'm i'm perfectly fine with it uh i i the thing is that uh you can make a show out of things and say this is amazing this is what we're going to do and so on and so forth and it's it's fine but those things have been around for quite a while already so if you look at animal electrophysiology recordings they have been recording with multiple uh electrodes arrays for a long time okay yeah. with like at least up a hundred electrodes the famous utah array that a lot of people doing animal physiology use so they are proposing, you know, arrays with a thousand uh, um, uh, ability of, of recording from the brain and so forth. So I have nothing against it. The point is that it's not that nobody think was thinking about it and then all of a sudden this happened. Right. It's just the way you present it. But uh, the thing is that there are issues in being able to do that in the human brain that are pretty big. So, um, you know, is not that you just implant something and that's it. You right. know, issues with severe inflammation you mm -hmm. can get, deterioration of what you're using uh, uh, to register or stimulate the brain and so forth. So, um, yeah, there is no clinical trial active as yet, and yeah. I don't think there will be any in a while. Recording from animals and making uh, people listen to the sound of a neuron is fun, is nice, mm -hmm. but been around for a while being done by many labs so um, I'm not saying it's nothing new but I'm just saying that um, and if that brings attention to the issue of, of working more on how to make this uh, new techniques work properly I'm happy with that and uh, or even even better disperse some funding right. so, so that people can apply for grants and work right. all together right. on those issues so right. Neuralink sounds fun, but is I'm not saying it's nothing new, but it's just like you know, uh, just incremental, right. not super new. Right. That's all. Yeah. So, but I'm nothing against it. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, like you know, he he said he would he would create a tunnel uh, in Los Angeles to be able to avoid traffic, and he and he did it. So <laughs> a lot of people are like, okay, well, I guess I guess this is happening, right? Because his track record has been pretty good in terms of being able to make things oh, he's happen. A, the guy's a genius, right. so no doubt right. about it. Right. So. But, but I mean, certainly the science behind it isn't just clear cut. Okay, we implant, we implant in the brain and then everything's going to get better. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of people are trying to do this kind of implants in the brain. I mean, uh, I don't remember where the group is, but there are papers where they've implanted electrodes in the back of the brain and having subject that were blind, uh, try, uh, starting to see again something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, my response to that is, well, well because what I do, I'm biased, uh, right, is, right. well, what the subject is reporting 
could you also just do that by stimulating the exactly. brain on invasive yeah, ways? So, yeah. but that's you know that's my opinion. But so in general, or like you have deep brain stimulation. I mean, that's right. an amazing technique right, right. and really efficient. Have you ever seen a Parkinson patient? I sure have. Yeah, yeah. and me too. W- with the machine on and off, we right. just like. Right. What? Let's really? put a video up right now. We're going to b- be putting a video up below of someone getting DBS prior or or being on DBS and then off DBS and then their tremor is just like so when they're off. Di- so deep brain stimulation is basically implanted invasive stimulation that goes to a certain part of the brain that is affected in Parkinson's disease, right? And then you basically turn the machine on and that significantly decreases their tremors right and then but then when you turn it off their tremors just like go through the roof all right? of a sudden, yeah, yeah all of a sudden it's, it's uh it's really impressive but how many people have access or are eligible for this kind of techniques? Right, they're very. It's very. It's a very specific kind of Parkinson's disease group. Yeah. Park, very specific kind of Parkinson's disease group. I'm sure it's very expensive too. Right, right. So who can have that implanted in their head right. and so on and so forth? So, are we really able to reach out to a big number of patients with right. those treatment, those impressive treatment? Yeah. Uh, we might not. So. Again, going back to non-invasive brain stimulation might be an alternative good technique to do that. Yeah, so because it's relatively relatively inexpensive, right? Uh, relatively simple to put together. Um, and I really like, like I know you mentioned, and I know we talked about, you know, people kind of DIY doing it themselves, right? And they can get injured, they have burns, right? They cannot be doing it right at all, right. especially like on the commercial market, like so, some of these other um, uh, brain stimulation devices. Um, but I really like the autonomy that it provides some people potentially, Actually, right? Like yes. it's, it's pretty cool. I love the idea. And in fact, as part of this clinical trial we'll do, we're doing with uh, cortically blind patients, going back to that because it's the one that we're just actively starting, uh, the, we, the last thing we will do is actually we're thinking about potentially uh, a virtual reality system where you send home the virtual reality uh, machine right. where inside you can actually monitor their eyes and so you will have a built-in eye tracking system so that they will not move their eyes as they're training mm-hmm. and then they can get also stimulated as they're doing it right. so they can train at home you can remotely control it and uh, there are a few trials just a paper just came out uh, a group in new york where they sent the machine, well, during pandemic, we had to become creative. Right. What can we do? How right, can right. we do this? Right. Uh, so they sent the brain stimulation package at home to mm-hmm. patients. Uh, they could control it remotely from the department, mm-hmm. from the center. And so the patients were doing it themselves and then would send back their data, their information. So what if with our patients, we could do something similar? Yeah. But in our case with vision, we really need to control what they're doing with their eyes. Right. Uh, and so if you have a virtual reality system, you can actually, instead of using their monitor or other things that won't work, right. you can just build one entire package where they are at home, they do their training on a daily basis, half an hour, an hour, and they're done with it. And then we, got, we get those data we analyze them and see what happens. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. And the virtual reality segment, we, we just had, I just recorded an episode, it's going to be coming out pretty soon with Mayank Mehta, who's a, the, um, the director of the, um, of the neurophysics uh, department here. Uh-huh. And he's doing work on virtual reality and he's finding, um, he actually made a cool virtual reality set for a mouse, right? Oh, that's so, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. awesome. You got to check it out. But he's been also showing that, you know, there's increased neuroplasticity, uh, potentially increased uh, memory consolidation specifically in the hippocampus might be a little bit different but nonetheless you know if you're incorporating virtual reality potentially right that can also increase uh, neuroplasticity it's in the context of brain injury yeah, yeah it really exactly. is exactly so and you really uh, it's a richer environment that you can control right so it's uh, kind of a dream <laughs> it is a dream um, where do you see uh, non-invasive neuromodulation in like 10 to 15 years 20 years uh, hopefully treating some diseases that currently are not treatable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, I have this bias toward uh, uh, diseases and deficits. Uh, so obviously that would be my ideal because I want to be able to help patients uh, to become active again and so forth. And so my idea is that we might be able to s- have some devices that are really 
well control, well structured, and people can yes use them and uh, get some real benefit. Yeah. So I see it going that direction. So um, do you see a replacing? Do you see a replacing medications in certain disease states or not? So I don't see replacing medications necessarily. Although maybe for some diseases it might. Uh, what I would like to see is to be able. So if I really have to look into the future, it you go you get your genetic profile because also there are some studies showing that some people with a specific genetic profile might respond better to stimulation than others mm -hmm. so oh really yeah so you can go and get your profile and know what you can respond to what can be good for you and then really design the ideal treatment yeah so i'm talking in terms of for the disease but it can also be in potentiation functions right. in just healthy subjects as so or since we are living longer you want to live longer fine but you want to lo live longer with a healthy brain right so if that technique that can bring you from 45 minutes to 90 minutes support your functions mm -hmm. your attentional functions don't you want to be that guy when you are 85 and right. go and play a tennis right. game and right. doing great? Right. Why not? Yeah. Or just, you know, just be there with your head and yeah. not just a bunch of zombies. <laughs> 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 Everybody yeah. over 100 but just zombie. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So no, I mean, uh, we're joking now, but uh, that is a real issue. Yeah. Uh, so the elderly population is increasing. Right. We're definitely living longer. Um, I think Biden said they're going to put more money into the NIH to uh, for Alzheimer's disease, for instance. So you really want to try to have a healthy brain. Right. Yeah. Of course, healthy habits, uh, eating well, right. sleeping well, doing all those important things. But then, yeah. can you support? Yeah. And avoid deterioration. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's always sort of a disclaimer that we give with every like episode where we're talking about these sort of things on the frontier of medicine. Um, and it's not a panacea. Nothing is going to be a exactly. panacea, folks. Exactly. You're going to actually have to live like a healthy lifestyle that promotes good brain health. Right. But these are amazing things that can potentially supplement that that uh, that lifestyle to f increase uh, your brain health further. You know? Totally. Yeah, exactly. I was just uh, talking with my friend who works on sleep and she just had a book coming out and uh, she really talks about the importance of downstate versus mm -hmm. active state. So everything is an up and down, right? right. Your attention goes up and down. Right. You need to rest. You need to do things that really uh, promote and um, uh, your well-being in many ways right. so besides you know what you can do to manipulate and change your functions yeah i did want to bring this cool study up though uh did you see recently i think the group was out of sweden this was invasive so you know it's not like right up your alley but they did uh invasive neurostimulation to the spinal cord and they had a uh, switzerland switzerland yeah i know it started with an s <laughs> uh, but so and it, Europe, yeah, but yeah, south of Europe, yeah, Switzerland, yeah, yeah. They so they did. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. They stimulated, you know, the spinal cord, a certain area in the spinal cord, and it actually helped paraplegics uh, cycle unassisted, walk. I think in like sort of a walker system, completely unassisted, yes. went where they weren't able to do that at all before. I think they had no function in their lower extremities before. Yeah, no or minimal, and then now with sort of this invasive. Uh, neurostimulation right because it was stimulating somewhere in the central nervous system right now they're able to walk it's amazing it's incredible yeah yeah again uh accessibility though uh right. you know yeah. uh it's like um all those nice beautiful fancy prosthesis you can build uh for you know to help people walk again so you put this beautiful ro robot uh prosthesis right, on right. their legs and they can walk how does that cost right how much? A lot. So, a lot. So know, who can do that? Right? But, you know, I think so that... But in general, I know, I'm sorry, I keep going back to availability of right, things right. and so forth. So, but uh, I think it is important in the end that we all have the right access to everything. Right. So. But I think that what history tells us, right, and the reason that this kind of stuff really, really excites me a lot, regardless of availability, is because if you just look at history, things that you know, initially are just like completely not available to the general public, suddenly, you know, secondary to, you know, improve, improve uh, technology, right, just becomes more available, right? It's never something where, oh, this works, 
and it works really well and we're able to do it and it just it just stays not available to everyone i think an example of that and this is like way off the reservation but it's like space travel right like initially it was like first man on the moon completely amazing right we can only do this once every year or something like that right and now you know jeff bezos is blasting off into space right so i mean like certainly he's a billionaire right but now it's more accessible to sort of just wealthy people and then eventually that's gonna that's gonna progress to just people in the general population right so like that's sort of my understand or my thinking in terms of these amazing amazing breakthroughs and neurostimulation. stimulation yeah. certainly yeah yeah no no this is very true and uh, it's also interesting the pattern of how brain stimulation for instance uh, uh, was being performed in 17, 1800 right. in all sorts of weird ways. Right, right. <laughs> but, you know, everything started from the studies of Galvani and you, they could see that you can uh, run the current through the body and make things change, right, uh, you right. know, an arm move or a leg, uh, the frog leg move and so forth. Yeah. So then there was, you know, like everybody was doing this brain stimulation but then the first world war came and then brain stimulation was being used in a strange way and so it was abandoned and then huh. freud came and said it's better to talk than to stimulate <laughs> and you're saying it's better to do both exactly right? exactly yeah. so um and so you know things and then again they started to use it again and now we have this you know uh uh, increasing number of people using it and so forth right. so you know you need to start somewhere you need to start somewhere yeah. um we got five minutes left do you want to is there anything that you want to talk about real quick regarding some of the work you're doing is there anything that you want to promote regarding your work and what you're doing at harvard well uh promotion yes so we are actively recruiting patients so anybody can find us on the clinicaltrials.gov okay. uh, under my name and uh so uh we are doing this treatment for cortical blindness and so we are very interested in uh in uh, seeing those kind of patients mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh besides that i hope i've given an idea of this is not one size fits all uh, but it's important to think about what you're doing and uh, but you know i think neuromodulatory procedures are pretty exciting and interesting so you know i will continue to use them yeah <laughs> no it's incredible it's absolutely amazing that we can change behavior change disease states not with medications just simply with altering potentially like electrical currents and and, uh, and the oscillatory pattern in our brain it's yes. incredible it's amazing it's amazing it's fantastic just don't go home and do it yourself don't but uh, not ask yet. the experts not, not yet. yet not yet uh so be cautious uh uh be informed uh read about it and ask us what you want to ask and reach out to lorella botelli yeah. in <laughs> clinicaltrials.gov <laughs> if you want to be part of a study for cortical blindness <laughs> all right folks thank you everyone for joining dr botelli thank you so much for coming on thank you pleasure to be here please thank come you. on any other time whenever you we have do. any breakthroughs <laughs> please come <laughs> announce them on the podcast we'd love to Great have you to back be here thank yeah. you yeah all right folks if you guys have any questions there's an email um at the bottom of the video description please reach out to us any questions if you need to get connected with dr batelli and you're having a hard time you can just email us there and i can connect to you yeah yeah totally. all right cool thank you very much everybody this is the brain sport podcast thank you very much uh have a wonderful day stay safe be well bye bye